at 23 now, so it's still checking in. So uh, it's a good thing. Well, uh, Dennis, I want to turn it over to you, and what we'll, we'll we'll officially start the meeting right now, but then we're going to hold off our business meeting until after our guest speaker. So, get Dennis, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce Bill and uh, go from there. Okay, thanks, Dale. So tonight we have with us Bill Mira, uh, N2CQR. Bill is the host of the Solder Smoke podcast, or one of the co-hosts of the Solder Smoke podcast. He uh, is author of three books, at least three that I have found, um, ham radio related. It's Solder Smoke, uh, Global Adventures in Wireless Electronics. Also the book Contra Cross and Us and Them. And Bill has had a long career in our foreign service, posted around the world, and has operated as I am in, in many different countries. Um, on the Solder Smoke podcast, he promotes homebrewing and international brotherhood among hams. And I'm very pleased to introduce Bill Mera and to CQR. Bill. And, and, and let, me, let me encourage everybody to shut their mics, mute their mics in the meantime so we don't get any interruptions. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, great. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks, thanks, Dale, and thanks to all of you for having me as a guest speaker tonight. It's a real, it's a real pleasure. And Dennis and I were talking about what what I should talk about here with you. And really, I I don't want to get into a kind of a detailed presentation on home brewing of single sideband equipment or anything like that, or the kind of stuff that we talk about a lot on the Solder Smoke podcast. What I thought we'd do instead is just sort of share some some anecdotes about my time as a ham radio operator no and, and i think that what's going to happen is that you yeah. guys are going to see a lot that you kind of recognize that oh, you good. that you can relate to and be, because one of the things that we found in the solder smoke podcast is that we very often share what we call a knack story something that happened that caused us to get interested in ham radio very often it happened when we were quite young, we were, you know, 12, 13 years old. And then it continued and it caused us to sort of stay with the hobby for a long time and have it become a very important part of our lives. So what I want to talk do it tonight maybe is just share some some kind of anecdotes from my own personal knack story. And I think some of that will will resonate with with you guys. Um, my early my earliest memories of interest in in radio and electronics come really from my grandmother. She decided that I was electrically inclined. I think she got this idea when I was the only one in the family who could set the timer on the light that she had in her living room in the Bronx. That so when she was away, she wanted the light to come on so that burglars wouldn't come in. And I was the only one who could figure out how the timer worked. At that at that point, she declared me to be electrically inclined. And I think that's one of the things that put me on the path towards ham radio. But what really got me on the path to ham radio was a fellow named Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard was a ham radio operator. His call sign was K2ORS. But he was also uh, an author, a radio personality, a maker of movies and TV shows. He was quite a big deal during the 1970s and the 1980s. Some of his books you may have heard of, Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories and Other Disasters, Ferrari in the Bedroom, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. These are the, the books that Shepard wrote. But Shepard had a show on, on WOR Radio in New York. Every night he would go on and he would just sort of ad lib for an hour or two hours, telling stories about when he was a kid, when he was in the army, when he was in college, all this stuff, when he was a radio engineer. And some of his stories were about when he was a radio amateur as a kid. He described his ham radio experience as a kid in Hammond, Indiana. And he talked about him and a group of his friends who sort of formed kind of a, a gang focused on radio and electronics. And among all kind of teenage boys, there was a bit of hierarchy. There was a bit of competition. The competition was based on technical ability, the ability to build something, build something unusual. One of the guys in his group, Shepard told the story, produced the very first television receiver Shepard ever saw. The screen was only very small, but it was a working television receiver 
built in the in the late 1930s in Hammond, Indiana, which was quite a trick, I must say. But Shepard, in his stories, when he talked about ham radio on WOR in New York, and I would listen because my father was a New York City cop, and very often he was home when Shepard was coming on, and he and I would sit there and listen. And Shepard described ham radio. And that's, that's how I got interested in ham radio was through Gene Shepard. And Shepard always talked about a ham radio hobby that was very focused on technical achievement, technical expertise, learning how the equipment worked, building your own gear. And I guess that's what kind of took me in combination with my um, being electrically inclined, as my grandmother said, into kind of a more technical approach to the hobby. And that's really, I guess, how I became kind of a home brewer. Um, my early homebrew experiences, I look back on it now, and I, I really didn't understand that I was a home brewer from the earliest days. My first sideband rig was given to me by the guys in the, in the local radio club that I was in, 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 in suburban New York, the Crystal Radio Club, W2DMC. And I had just gotten my general class license, and I wanted to get on phone. I wanted to, to, to get on 20 meter phone and talk and work DX. And I went into the club one night and they handed me a Heathkit HW32A, one of the monoband Heathkit rigs. It's like, looks sort of like an HW101, but a monobander. And I remember when they handed it to me, it felt really light. It felt like it was like an empty box. There was not enough heft to it. You know, this was the, this, this was the days of... Uh, of vacuum tubes and, and, and real pieces of gear were hefty. This thing was really light. And then I asked the guys, I looked at the back and I said, well, where do I plug it in? And there was a big octal socket on the back where you plugged in the power supply. And this thing didn't have a power supply. And I said to the guys, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And they looked at me like, like I had asked a stupid question. They said, well, go out and find a discarded TV set pull out the transformer and the rectifier stuff and the choke and build yourself a power supply for this thing. That's how you get on. They treat it as, as if this was something as trivial as hooking up an AC power line. Sure. I mean, I was, I was like 14 years old at this point. It's a miracle. I didn't blow myself up and get killed and electrocuted, but I did what they said. I found a discarded TV. I pulled out the transformer. I put together uh, the power supply I mean, today, this would be considered a major technological achievement by a 14-year-old kid. But back then, they just thought, well, yeah, of course, you're going to build a power supply like everybody else did. So I guess, I guess that, that, was, that really qualified as my first kind of homebrew project. But then I, I took on another project, and, and, I, and this was a, a painful one. There was an article in QST at the time. Some of you guys may remember the Tuna Tin 2. They built a little QRP rig on the top of a can of tuna. I don't know why. They, 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 okay, they called it the tuna tin too. They used the can of tuna as the chassis. But there was a receiver that went with it called the Herring Aid 5. Get it? Like a hearing aid, herring aid, the fish, can of fish. And they had the diagram in there. And I decided I wanted to be a real radio amateur like Gene Shepard. I wanted to build my own receiver and at least have one receiver that I built. So I gathered the parts. One of the things about this, this, this receiver was you could buy all the parts from Radio Shack. So I went out and I gathered all the parts and man, I carefully put this thing together. I worked on this thing for weeks, building this little, it, looking back on it, a simple direct conversion receiver. And I could not get it to work. It just would not work. It sat there, it defied. I, I hooked it up every way you could think of. I did the troubleshooting and everything else. And I just couldn't get it to work. And this was the day, of course, in the days long before the internet. So it's not like I could just post a message and say, somebody help me. How do I get this thing to work? I was well and truly stuck. And I never got that thing to work. I didn't get the thing to work for 38 years. <laughs> so I just kind of abandoned the project. And much later, just in the last few years, I decided to, to try again and, and finally got that thing to work. But it, it, it was an early bitter experience with, with the, uh, what we call a tale of woe. Dennis knows what I'm talking about here. Dennis is building a six meter rig and he's had a few tales of woe, of pain because being a homebrew ham radio operator, 
it's not for the faint of heart. It's not plug and play. It's not easy. There's a lot of pain and weeping and gnashing of teeth involved in this. And, and so I had my share of that as, as a teenager. Um, uh, they mentioned in introducing me that I kind of lived around the world and went and lived in many, many different places. And Dennis mentioned that. Um, I guess my next episode in, in home brewing took place in the Dominican Republic, which was my third overseas tour with the Foreign Service. I got there and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, looked at these boxes that had accumulated in my living room, these cardboard shipping crates. And she said, hey, what's in those boxes? And I said, well, it's my little ham radio gear. She said, well, why don't you pull it out and get it working? That'd be fun. And that got me back into the hobby after probably about eight or nine years of absence. So I got back in with a Drake 2B and a Helicrafters HT37, got on the air from the Dominican Republic, had great fun, and also did some some a new a new effort at home brewing. I mean, Gene Shepard's voice was kind of ringing in my ears a little bit, saying, "Don't be a commercially oriented guy. Don't use commercial equipment. Build some of your own gear. At least some of your own gear you should build." So I built my first CW transmitters uh, for 20 meters. Again, out of AR ARRL books, I got them to work. I got on the air, and I kind of experienced that that thrill of of saying to the other guy, "Rig here is home brew, right?" And it it's is a very satisfying thing. So I, I did that there. I continued in um, kind of our our next overseas post, which was the Azores Islands of Portugal. I'll just share with you a little anecdote here. You guys are get a kick out of this. So I'm out in the Azores Islands of Portugal, which are, it's about 1400 miles off the coast of Portugal, about two thirds of the way over the Atlantic Ocean. Those of you who've been in the Air Force know it's a place where Lodges Field is. And we were out there. Um, it's a great place for ham radio. You've got the biggest saltwater ground plane you can imagine in every direction. If you look south from the Azores, there is nothing until Antarctica, except for islands like St. Helena, Ascension, Tristan de Cunha, places like that. A lot of good exotic DX. But I decided there in the Azores that I would sort of get out of, get away from CW a little bit, do some phone home brewing, home brewing for phone. Home brewing for CW is pretty easy. Home brewing for phone is a lot harder. So I started easy and I started by building double sideband transmitters, a double sideband transmitter, not an AM transmitter, really. This, this, the, the carrier is suppressed, but there's no filtering. I'm doing both sidebands at the same time. And I wanted to build for 17 meters. So I got on 17 meters with a double sideband transmitter. And I, it was really funny because guys would come on, I would call CQ and then I'd get some guy on, come on frequency and say, Hey, listen, uh, Glad you're calling CQ, old man, but got to tell you, you're on the wrong sideband. I'm listening to you on lower sideband here. You're wrong. And then I would, I would just very gently say, well, look, it's not, not that. I'm on both, actually. And if you hit the USB button on your transceiver, you'll hear me just as well. I'm on USB and LSB. So I did that for a while. This was during a, a good, good time in the sunspot cycle. So with five watts, double sideband and wire antennas, I was like working the world. This was great fun. And, and, and very satisfying from the homebrew perspective. A little bit later, still out in the Azores, I decided that I was being socially irresponsible by doing both sidebands. So I got to get rid of one sideband. So I built this thing and you can see it here. This is the transmitter that I built in the Azores more than 20 years ago. And it's a single sideband transceiver. It's got a transmitter. It's got filters in it. So it's only one sideband, upper sideband. And I put this thing together. The filter actually comes out of a Swan 240 transceiver, which is a, an ancient, ancient piece of gear. The, the, the crystals in the filter here were made in 1962, but they still work and I'm still using them in a transmitter. But this was a funny thing. I, I, when I put, after I'd been on double sideband for a while in the Azores, I put this thing on the air, single sideband. And guys who had gotten used to my double sideband signal came on frequency and said, Bill, something is wrong with your rig. You've lost one of the sidebands. You're only on one sideband. And I, I, I said, well, man, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because that was the whole point of building this thing. I'm kind of in a nostalgia phase right now. So I put this thing back on the air. I've made some improvements. 
you know, you live and learn. I look back on it. I found some stuff that I did wrong that I could have done better. I've improved it. I've had it on the air and I built, I'm using it with a little receiver up here. This little box up here is a, a very simple super head receiver and I operate split. So I'm one of the few guys, I'm like Rip Van Winkle. Back in the day, almost all transmitters and receivers were in separate boxes, often by separate manufacturers. But I've gone back to that now and, and I, I, I'm, do, I'm doing that. I was on 17 meters with it today. So I have a lot of fun with that. From there, we went to London. I guess the big thing that happened in London was the Solder Smoke podcast. And I'll just, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. I don't want to drone on and you guys got the rest of the meeting to, to talk about. And maybe we'll do some questions here as when I wrap up. But I got to, we got to London and I continued to homebrew. But I started to talk to a, a buddy of mine in Alaska, Mike, KL7R. And I had read a magazine article. I was talking to him on Echolink, which is sort of like uh, kind of faux ham radio. You get on the internet, you could talk to people. I would talk to him and we were both interested in homebrew radio. We would talk about our projects. Mike was more advanced than I. And so he helped me a lot. And then one day I told him, I said, hey, Mike, you know, I heard about this, these things called podcasts. This was when podcasts was very new. This was like 2005. And I said to him, you know, and people are just recording them and then they put them up on the internet and other people listen. And I described the podcast and I didn't know it, but he had hit the record button and he recorded that conversation. That became Solder Smoke number one. That was the very first Solder Smoke podcast. Uh, our podcast now, I think we're up to something like 230, something like that, 230 podcasts. We, we do about once a month. We don't want to do it more than that because we're afraid if we do it more than that, we become a cult and we don't want to be a cult. We want to just be a podcast. So we do once a month. I do it now. Unfortunately, Mike was killed in a car accident uh, a few years after we started the podcast. More recently, I've been working with a fella, a really master uh, home brewer, Pete Giuliano, N6QW, a great, a great, uh, a man with really deep technical expertise. He's probably built more single sideband transceivers than anybody alive. And, and he comes on the podcast with me and we just talk about what we're working on, what we're doing. We have a good time and people, people seem, seem to like it. So the birth of the Solder Smoke podcast was really in London. And that's where it got, where, the, where, where its origins were. And we've, we've done it ever since. And, we do about once a month. We have blogs that go along with it, but it's mostly focused on whatever we're working on at the time right now. So we'll probably do another podcast here in the next week or so. And I'll be talking about this thing, what I learned, what I messed up, my tales of woe, how things went well, things that didn't go well. We try to be honest and we try to tell people that, you know, often, you know, we're not experts either. Uh, Pete's an engineer, but I'm not, but we both, regularly mess things up and solder the wrong terminal in and blow the thing up and release smoke. And we're, we try to be straightforward and honest about it. But anyway, those are some anecdotes from my, my time as a ham radio operator. I'm no, I'm no expert. We just have a lot of fun with this. And the, the podcast gives us a chance to talk about it with a, with a pretty wide audience. We have people from all around the world. One other thing I'll say, Dennis mentioned the international brotherhood thing. And I, as a, as somebody who's lived around the world, I think this is really important because I've discovered that no matter where you go in the world, you'll find people who have stories very similar to mine, very similar to yours. That for some reason, when they were 13 or 14 years old, they got interested in electronics and radio and they've stuck with it ever since. And so I, I've also found that in radio clubs, radio clubs around the world are very similar. I, I walked into the radio club in the Dominican Republic many years ago and felt right at home. It had the same stuff, the same gear, the same junk boxes, the same pile of old musty magazines. It was all very familiar and the same sort of cast of characters there talking about ham radio stuff. So that's, that is something that we try to emphasize in the in the podcast and in the blog, it's easy because we get mail from everywhere, all around the world. People write in talking about the project, sharing technical information, sharing parts, expertise, offers of help. It really is what we, we jokingly refer to as the International Brotherhood of Electronic Wizards. And it's this, the hobby is this, this interest in technical stuff and ham radio that sort of pulls everybody together. And it's really, it's quite, quite nice. 
But with that, I'll wrap up. And Dennis, let me know if there's any questions or if I've missed anything or, or what, what do you guys want to talk about? Well, I guess I have a question, and that is for, for someone who hasn't done much home brewing, what, what would you think would be a, a really, really good first project for someone to try to tackle? You know, we always, we get this question a lot. And, and one of the things that, one of the, the, the opposite question, your question is really good, but usually what we get is a guy said, wow, I've never built anything, but I saw that five band, single side band transceiver that Pete was working on, and I'm going to build one of those. And we, we got, we, we both say, well, wait a second, you know, don't, you gotta, you gotta walk before you run, you know, you don't, don't jump in, don't bite off more than you can chew. All those kind of metaphors apply. I would say start off with something small. We usually tell people to build, and you guys will like this, the Michigan Mighty Might. The Michigan Mighty Might. I'm talking to a group from Michigan here. The Michigan Mighty Might. It's a, sim it's a very simple circuit. One transistor, about eight parts. You wind the coil on an old film can or an old piece of plastic. You plug in a little crystal. Usually the crystal's a color burst crystal out of old TV sets, 3579 kilocycles. And it's a one transistor CW transmitter. Now, guys will say, well, I don't do CW. I'm not interested in it. And we tell them, it doesn't matter. The purpose of building this thing is not to get on the air. It's nice if you can get on the air, but that's not really the objective. The objective is to produce a radio signal using something that you made with your own hands. And once you do that, you, you move to an entirely different level in the hobby. No longer are you completely dependent on commercial equipment. You have built a, at least a one-stage transmitter that's capable of communicating. You become a home brewer at that point. And we, I think we've distributed 40 or 50 crystals to people around the world. I tell people, you know, we, we tell you to build this Michigan Mighty Might. You need the crystal. We have a bunch of the crystals. So if you want, tell me and I'll send you one. And I, we, we sent out about 40 or 50 of them. I got in trouble with the post office because I was trying to stick them into like first class mail envelopes. And I, apparently that, that's not allowed. But anyway, there's guys who have built these things all around the world. I would say build that first then move a little bit further, maybe build a little direct conversion receiver so you can listen. That's a real big moment when you can listen to some to guys talking on the radio with a receiver that you built yourself. That's a great moment. And I always tell people, you know, you should try this stuff because it, it, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. When you turn that receiver on and you start listening to guys talking on 20 meters, let me tell you, that's a, that's a feeling of accomplishment that's, uh, that's really, really very satisfying. Yeah. It does, does anyone else want to jump in with a question? I was going to say, people can unmute now. And, uh... Hey, Dennis. Dennis, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Ken. For Bill, I got a question. When you're traveling all over the world, you're trying to build these things. How was access to parts, materials, that type of stuff when you're in yeah. these other countries? I mean, it's gotten a lot easier. But when, when I was doing this, it, in some ways it was hard. In some ways it was easy. Mm -hmm. Early on, during the like the early mid nineties, it was difficult because we didn't really have access to Mauser and DigiKey and all this other stuff. There was no eBay, there was no Amazon, any of that stuff. But I found places where you could get parts. And, and ironically, if you were in a, in a third world country, you were in a country where people still repaired things. You know, they were, there, there wasn't this discard the electronics and get something new. If the radio broke, they would try to fix it. So there was if you knew where the neighborhoods were, and this is where I would learn from the, uh, the local club, they would tell me, go down to this particular street in Santo Domingo, and you'll find shop after shop with parts. You'll even find guys operating from the street corner who will rewind a transformer for you. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I went down there and I had, I had blown up the transformer on my HT37. And I, this kid was on the corner and I said, do you re rewind transformers? He says, yeah. I said, can you do this one? He said, yeah. And for about 10 bucks, he rewound my, my transformer. So you can find, you could find the parts even back then. And now it's gotten a whole lot easier. I mean, I was, I was talking to a good friend of ours, a master home brewer is Farhan in India in Hyderabad, VU2 ESE. And we were just recently talking and he said that uh, he can buy from Mauser the same way I can buy from Mauser. 
So you go online, you just order the parts and I get it here and he gets it in Hyderabad. So the world has gotten a lot smaller and, and traveling around getting parts. It's, I think it's easier than ever, actually. I was going to had him uh, just jump in there when you mentioned uh, Gene Shepard. You, you, I think you failed to uh, give him credit for his most famous movie, The Christmas Story. Correct. Right. That's right. That's right. Where he warned, where Ralphie warned, you know, about the the Red Rider BB gun. Man, it's traumatic stuff. I mean, this is, but that's real Shepard. She, I got to tell you one story about Shepard. Shepard told that was him narrating that, though, right? That's I, I, I think it was. But Shepard yeah. tells a story that really grabs every, all of us. And it's a story about when he was about 14 years old, he was trying to get on a 160 meter AM using Heising modulator, a Heising modulator. And he could not get it to work right. It was distorting badly. Guys were calling him a lid. Guys were telling him, get your rig fixed before you're messing up the whole band. And he was obsessed. He got obsessed with fixing this thing. Those of us who've been in the homebrew game know what this obsession is like. I mean, you wake up at, at two o'clock in the morning wondering, why can't I get my Heising modulator working? He had a date he had a date with a girl from the high school. They were both about 14, 15 years old. So he takes her out, but he can't get his mind off the technical problem, the Heising modulator. And she notices that he's not paying attention to what she's saying. His mind is elsewhere. And finally, she says to him, is there something wrong? And he looks at her and he says, yes, there is. I can't get my Heising modulator to operate properly. And she looked at him and she said, I think there's something wrong with you. You should have your mother take you to a doctor. <laughs> I mean, but, but you know, if, if, if you've got the knack, if you're, if you're, one, of, if you're one of us, you could sit there and think, I can understand that completely, man. How the guy was, the guy, his Heising modulator didn't work. I mean, what, what did she expect? <laughs> anyway, yeah, Gene Shepard, good, good stuff. Yeah. I, I talked to him one night. He was on, uh, on a call in show in New York. WMCA had a call in show. He was with Long John Neville and, and Candy Jones. And I called in and thanked him for, for getting me involved in ham radio. <laughs> one other question. When you talk about homebrew, I know you guys are doing a lot where you're taking a schematic and finding your own parts. How do you feel about kit building equaling yeah, I mean, homebrew? I think I think one of the things about kit building is, I mean, it, it's great because you're 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 involved in the circuitry, but it, it's it's not really home brewing. Not really. We had this discussion recently. I have on the shelf behind me a, a Heath Kit HW101, a kit. No one would look at that rig and say that's a homebrew rig. That's a kit. It's a kit build rig. It's something different. I mean, I guess it depends on the approach you take. If you, if you try to understand what, what the circuitry is, what's going on in the circuitry, then you're kind of getting close to what goes on with a home brewer. But if you're just stuffing the board with parts and not even thinking about what they do and just knowing that in this slot, R6 goes here and Q7 goes there, and you don't know what R6 and Q7 are doing, then, I mean, then I think... You're, you're missing out quite a bit. Unfortunately, a lot of kit building is like that. So uh, we, we do talk mostly about kind of straight, kind of complete home brewing. Look, I don't even like to use chips. To tell you the truth, I've talked about this on the, on the podcast. I don't like to use an integrated circuit chip if I don't know really what's going on in there. I've, I've recently lightened up a bit on this, but I still, if I'm going to use an NE602 chip, at least I want to know what's going on inside the 602 chip. I don't want to use it as a little black mystery box that I plug in there and it just becomes a part of the circuit that I don't know anything about. Gene Shepard would not approve. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me I shoot my eye out with a soldering gun. Oh man, the soldering <laughs> gun. Yeah, you got to have a soldering gun. <laughs> I, I related that uh, you talked about the, the first couple of projects that don't work. I, I think I had probably three or four projects before, and they're all very small, but you know, you, you get disappointed that you go in there and you build this thing and it seems simple enough and doesn't work and you can't fix it. And uh, I can remember the first project I finally got to work. It was like winning the lottery. Oh yeah. It's a great feeling. You know, a couple of, one, couple of things I'd comment on that. We all, we, we've all been there. Pete Giuliano, who I consider like the, 
the the the, the, ma the master builder he tells me that he has in his in his shack at his workshop what he calls his shame shelf his shelf of shame where he's built something he can't get it to work and he puts it up there but another reason that dale there's another reason why a lot of these rigs didn't work and this is something that you discover later as a home brewer there were serious errors in the schematics in even in qst magazine yeah. you would look at the qst magazine and when you're when you're 14 or 15 years old i mean qst magazine is like the authority if it's in qst it has to be right and you only discover when you're 30 or 40 years old that that's not true that there are very yeah. often errors in there errors that go unreported that that herring aid five receiver that i had so much trouble with it's not really an error but they failed to point out that you had to wind the coil on the, the on the oscillator in a certain direction or else you would it wouldn't oscillate right they just didn't mention that they just assumed that the 14 year old kid who was reading qst magazine would know that and it, it took me 38 years to discover that that was the problem. That's why it didn't work. So, yeah, I mean, that was, I think that was a one, one of the reasons for a lot of failures. But this points out one of the benefits of being a home brewer. You're not really dependent on that magazine or that schematic. You could look at it and say, hey, wait a second, wait a second. That capacitor is all wrong. It can't be that way. If you understand what, what's going on in the circuit, it helps you spot and get beyond those kind of errors a lot, I think. That's why you see. That's why you see two or three months after some construction articles published in QST in the hints or in the errata, you know <laughs> yeah. there'll be a little little footnote that says a little footnote, oh, yeah, that, 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 that nobody sees, and not, and not only that, some poor guy's been pulling his hair out for two months <laughs> without realizing this is for one thirty-eight of the, years. Yeah, thirty-eight <laughs> yeah. years, yeah. But this is one of the benefits of the of the internet now because now these errors come to light and are are pointed out. Look at it. he's got the handbook in his hand there. You know, I, I hate to say it, but one of one of my heroes as a ham radio guy was Doug was uh, Doug Dumas at, at you know at, at AWRL, a legend. But he made mistakes too. He's, he was human, yeah. just like the rest of us. And it's it's really kind of painful when you discover one. But then again, you realize, okay, look, yeah, he was a ham radio operator, just like the rest of us. And this is this is a hobby. It's for fun. We can make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. You know. I gotta I gotta echo your comment about parts because uh, uh, being able, you know, with the internet now, and I mean, it's it is so much easier. I I think the one thing though, and maybe you can comment on this that always seems to mystify me with radios is toroid, uh, toroids uh, themselves, you know, the actual toroid form. And they yeah. always talk about a T37 or this, or this mix or that mix, you yeah. know, uh, you don't really seem to get a whole lot of information. And that's maybe my lack of not seeking it out, but toroids in general just don't seem like there's something that, uh, you know, your comment, if you don't understand what it's doing, you're just winding wire on this thing. But, you know, what, what all these different mixes, I guess, what's the, what's yeah. the thing with I, that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, this is the kind of thing, it's not often explained very well. One of the things that you find is that guys who are really good engineers are often not really good explainers of the technology. So there, there'll be a <laughs> whiz at engineering, but when they try to write it up, you look at it and you say, what the heck is going on there? And this this often occurs in, in an area like, like Dave mentions with toroids, like what's the difference? It really comes down to there's, there's you know, iron powder cores and there's ferrite cores, different materials. And to get a given inductance, because in a, in, a, in a circuit, you're going to have to come up with an inductor of a certain value, two microhenries, right? And, and so you, you look at it and on a certain core, you'd have to put 16 turns on another core, you'd only have to put two or three. So it depends on the permeability of the core, the material, the kind of ferromagnetic material that's in there. And sometimes when guys are designing, they'll realize that you have to use a, a ferrite core or else you'd need an ungodly number of turns. Like if you use a regular iron powder core, you might need 87 turns and you just can't fit it on that core. So then they'll go and they'll use ferrite and you might be able to get the same inductance with only 20 or 16 turns. So it really becomes that. And there, 
there's all kinds of other factors involved too. But you could experiment a little bit. This is where it's useful to have a junk box. I mean, I have a big box over there with all kinds of toroid, toroid cores in it. And I can fool around and test. And I also have, it's also the important to have test gear because I have this little thing, it's an LC meter. And what this allows me to do is once I wind that toroid and I've put 16 turns on it, and I think it's supposed to be two microhenries, I take it and I'll put it in here and see if it's really two microhenries, right? And so this is a good way to, to test it, but you're right, it, it's a confusing area. It, and it, it helps to have some literature that, that, that clarifies things for you. That's why I got all these books back here. I would say it sort of takes a library because no one book is going to speak to you about all this stuff. I'll be reading the handbook sometime and I'll come on something and there'll be a topic like toroids and I'll say, damn, I don't know what this guy is talking about. But then I'll go pull out solid state design for the radio amateur or experimental methods in RF design. And maybe in that chapter where they're talking about the topic that I'm trying to understand, they'll explain it in a way that I get. Right. Maybe and, and it's, it's your mileage may vary. Different people have different approaches to understanding a technology. But I think it is important. It's important to have a big junk box, to have some test gear. And it really does help to have a lot of different books because one author might not explain it the way that, that you need it to be explained. All right. I don't want to hold you guys up. You got, you got your business meeting coming up. But that won't be nearly as entertaining. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, I really enjoyed it and uh and thanks very much for for inviting me good luck with everything you could always always shoot me an email listen to the podcast we'll, we'll probably put one out in the next few weeks and where the blog the blog's always there too and anything we could do to help but that's that's one of the other great things about ham radio this the spirit of helping the other other hams but uh but uh, dennis thanks very much for the for the invite and i i hope this is what you were what you were looking for Yes, thank you, Bill, so much for for joining us. It's it very I, I hope entertaining. I appreciates it, and uh, that was a very good uh, presentation. Okay, well, lots great. Of things right. back to me, I know. Thank, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. thank you, Bill. Bye, bye. Thanks, bye, -bye.